Uh, um, so we actually just have a, uh, we'll have just a really short delay because we have to uh, switch out a couple mics before the rest of our uh, panelists can join us. But I figured that I would at least um, maybe go ahead and start uh, trying to frame this just a little bit. Um, so this panel is called, um, uh, it's now called A Right to Drones, as it framed as, as a question. Um, it started off and uh, it's gone through various uh, different variations on, on what we thought that this might be about. And so we had started with thinking, um, is there a, we hear a lot about the, the things that we should be concerned about um, and the things that might justify not letting a technology um, continue to burden. Um, and then when we hear this sort of counter argument about um, why we should let that technology continue to grow, um, it's not, it's, it's a little bit of a apples to oranges kind, kind of thing. Um, so it's not necessarily like a, uh, it's more about the sort of functionality and the usefulness of the drone, right? So the most common thing that we hear about when, uh, a lot of times when we, when we talk about um, being pro-drone, uh, not in the, the military sense, but in the sort of sense that, you know, we can have uh, uh, a proliferation of, of civilian drones is, um, you know, we say they can be used for all of these good things, um, which just seems like a really difficult uh, justification against something like, um, yeah, but they really infringe on our sense of, like, privacy. Um, and so what we were hoping to try to do uh, when, we put to, when we decided to have a panel like this is to try to frame it more within a... Um, thinking about, you know, are there actual things within the law uh, that, or, or any other space within cultural or social norms um, that actually sort of justify us having uh, a right to, to drones? Um, obviously, the really difficult part of this conversation is that when we say drones, we are talking about a really wide spectrum um, of technologies. And so when we talk, uh, you know, having the right to a decommissioned uh, predator coming back from overseas is obviously a lot different than me having a right to, um, uh, to uh, Sergei's, you know, photo kite from earlier. Um, but I wanted to start by, uh, well, why don't I start by introducing our, our panelists. Um, directly to uh, my right is uh, Professor Christina Dunbar-Hester. Um, and she is an assistant professor of journalism and media studies at Rutgers University. Um, she's an ethnographer who studies the intersection of technical practice and political engagement. And her recent research centers on advocacy to raise awareness about diversity issues in hackerspace and free software communities. Um, next to her is uh, Frank Pasquale, uh, who's a professor of law now at University of Maryland. Um, and he's written extensively on the law of automation in contexts ranging from law enforcement uh, to healthcare to finance. Um, he was previously a professor at Seton Hall Law School, a uh, visiting fellow at Princeton Center for IT Policy, um, and a visiting professor at Yale Law School and Cardozo Law School. Um, next to uh, Frank, we have uh, uh, Patrick Egan, who is the editor of the America's Desk at SUAS uh, News and host and executive producer of the SUAS News um, podcast series. And he also serves as the president of the Silicon Valley chapter of AUBSI. Uh, he consults to the US Army Space and Missile Defense Command Battle Lab. Um, and he's been in the uh, unmanned aircraft uh, field for over eight years, working as a proponent for the business use of unmanned aircraft. Uh, and finally, all the way at the end, uh, is John Villasenor, who is a professor of electrical engineering uh, and public policy at UCLA. Uh, and a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Um, and he's also a member of the um, World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on the Intellectual Property System. And his work addresses the intersection of technology, policy, and law. Um, so thank you guys all for joining us here. Frank, I'm glad you could make it. <laughs> um, so what I wanted to try to do is, um, and I know this will uh, seem a little general at first, but I've been thinking about um, earlier when I went to lunch, I, I saw the, the protesters outside and I saw one of the signs that said, um, you know, we need to ban, uh, I think it said ban all, sur all weaponized and surveillance drones. Um, and again, I, I, it got me thinking about why we have a problem with talking about drones in this context, uh, right? Because if you, like, what is a surveillance drone? I mean, a, an, AR, an AR drone has the same sort of high definition camera that can stream, that kind of thing. So when we're talking about, it, so it's really difficult for us to sort of categorize, you know, what each, uh, you know, 
where does, even if we could ban something, where would that actually, you know, where would we draw the line on that? Um, and so I, was, I started thinking about how we could maybe sort of generalize this idea of having a right to drones. Um, and I kind of wanted to do it um, in the context that I think is sort of fitting with the uh, uh, interdisciplinarity of the people that we have up here. Um, so initially I was thinking that um, uh, often we, we talk about uh, a justification for drones is that other people have them, and so we should have them, uh, and that way we can protect ourselves. And, and, and that kind of argument seems to fall along the lines of more of a Second Amendment uh, kind of thing. Um, uh, other times we're talking about um, having drones as sort of a right to, to technology, and I think that splits up into two sort of different camps. So on the one hand, there's a right to technology where we care about a whole bunch of different things, right? We care about technology that makes our lives better, it makes us safer, um, uh, and, and a bunch of other considerations. But then we also have a, this sort of sense of, um, you know, uh, an argument that drones are a neutral platform, and therefore you should let me do whatever I want to do with it. Um, and and that, that seems to be driven more by a sense of like, a, sort of like a freedom of expression kind of uh, driver, um, and then finally, obviously, there's there's a, a very strong privacy context, and and I think um, you know we talk about well, if someone can have a drone and they can watch me, um, well, it would really be great if the technology became democratized enough that we could all have eyes on the people that had eyes on us, um, and so I kind of wanted to just sort of throw this out at you guys. Um, I'll, I'll do this one at a time. Um, but sort of throw it out to you guys and see if, like, how you feel about that sort of general classification, if that's sort of a fair thing, or whether you would sort of think about it differently. So I kind of wanted to start with Christina. Um, we, hear the tech, we hear the neutral technology argument all the time with drones. Um, we're constantly told that you know, they're just as easily weaponized as they are uh, armed to deliver vaccines to disaster-stricken communities. Um, so I would love to... I know you've done some thinking about this, and I'd love to sort of hear what you think in terms of like that argument and how that works as a justification for a right to drones. Okay, thank you, Chris, um, for your questions, and thank you, everyone. I may be the only person on this panel who doesn't have a policy engagement, really. Um, my background is in social and cultural studies of technology, and so uh, where I, you know, immediately start listening intently uh, around this rhetoric is this idea that uh, exactly what Chris just said, um, drones are not inherently anything. They can be put to good uses, they can be put to bad uses. Uh, we see this a lot in discussions of technology, and I, again, I teach undergraduate students and try to get them fired up. You know, what's one of the most provocative things I could get them to talk about? Dynamite, landmines, cluster bombs, you know, what and, and you can think of good uses to put these things too, uh, humanitarian or uh, demolition uses or something. Um, however, we do have some tools in the social studies of technology to think about this. Melvin Kranzberg famously said that technology is neither good nor bad, but nor is it neutral. And I think that that's a really useful starting point. Um, it's also the case that these aren't neutral tools that are just merely put to whatever uses human agents uh, desire. Technologies are always already shaped by powerful forces, and patterns have already formed around them which structure their use in, in patterned ways. So Langdon Winner, a, philosophy of a philosopher of technology, has said that certain technologies are in fact almost invariably linked to certain patterns of use. Social relations and power dictate not only how the technologies are used, but how they're even built in the first place. And so the patterns that will then shape use are inscribed into the artifacts. And so if we think about this with drones, uh, you know, are they a neutral technology? Yes, you could load one up with a cam camera, with a art project, you could use the camera to surveil citizens, you could use the camera to su surveil cops. Etc. But none of that really gets us to why drones exist in the first place. And they are a military technology. They have been built that way. And whether or not civilian uses can deviate from military ones, you know, that's the heritage of them at this point in time. And I don't think it should be controversial to say that. It's merely true. And I really like some of what Medea Tahir on the last panel was saying. Um, 
that I think it's up to the hobbyists and amateur and civilian communities who want to engage with these technologies to go a lot further than to just say, this is a neutral tool, look, we want to do something with it that isn't a military application at all. Uh, and I think there's a lot of evidence, in fact, in these communities that a demilitar demilitarized use isn't actually even necessarily the priority within these communities. Uh, I don't know how people in the audience or at this conference feel about that, but I, as an ethnographer, see evidence that you know, hacker spaces are sometimes taking DARPA funding. DARPA funded Maker Faire last year, and that was pretty controversial, but it happened. Uh, and I also know from conversations with people in hacker spaces that that's uh, not something people are universally comfortable with, but sometimes the technical conversations are a way of sort of papering over what might be political differences within hobbyist communities. And sometimes people talk about, um, you know, I have an example here actually, which I should read because otherwise I'll summarize it badly. Um, so one Philadelphia hackerspace person told me that she was put off by conversations on their listserv about one-winged flight, as in the movement of a maple seed fluttering to earth. She said of a member effusing about these principles of one-winged flight, uh, the guy talking about this is a very, very sweet guy and smart member of our group who happens to work for Lockheed, I think, but military industrial complex for sure. Um, so there can be an overlap between hobbyists and people employed by defense contractors. We shouldn't assume that hobbyists and amateurs have a demilitarized agenda in the first place. Um, but the other thing that she said was it was hard for her in the context of a hobbyist group to bring up potential differences in politics. She was able to tell me about it because you know it wouldn't have been awkward socially, but she felt like in the group, you know, they could have their fun conversations about flying a drone or a DIY project, but if they started to talk about the politics, it might get uncomfortable socially, and this is a, an amateur thing, something people do on their spare time, and they didn't want to do that. So I think that we have two take-homes from this. One, uh, there is no reason to ascribe neutrality to the technology. Empirically, that's not true. That's not where it came from. If it's going to become a demilitarized technology, that takes a lot of hard work, but serious attention to, to framing beyond just the issue of neutral use. Uh, and the other is, frankly, a challenge to people within you know, the practitioners and people who are at this conference. Uh, I don't take for granted that this hobbyist community has a demilitarized agenda necessarily. And in fact, I would kind of want to flip it around. Potentially, if you're taking DARPA funding or not having political conversations in your hacker spaces, you're actually doing PR work and even a little bit of R&D potentially for the military. And you know, if you're okay with that, fine, but maybe not everyone in your community is, and maybe that should be an explicit dialogue instead of something that gets papered over by just having you know, a fun time solving a techie problem together. That's my monologue, thank um, you. So thank you for that. Um, and, and I think I would certainly agree that the um Um, yeah, I think I would, I would certainly agree with the sort of, you know, there's no real reason to ascribe this, new, this you know, any kind of fake neutrality onto this technology. I mean, there are tons of uh, commentators uh, at NYU. We have Helen Nissenbaum, who's very into values and design, um, and, and this idea that, you know, all of these things are actually built into the technology, and the way that we design things actually, you know, dictates the kinds of things that they do and the way that they'll interact with our lives. And I think you can easily say that about about UAVs or, or drones. But I do kind of want to jump. Uh, uh, I'm going to blow my script already uh, because I do think I would push back a little bit, um, not personally, but just I've, you, I've heard commentators who would actually say that there is that it's actually wrong to just call it that it's like a demilitarized technology. Um, some would say that it actually, there's nothing inconsistent about, um, you know, the, about a military, uh, about the, the use of weaponizing an unmanned system in the military sense, uh, as it is with, you know, equipping any kind of other non-weaponized non sense in the sort of civilian sector, right? So it's not that, it's certainly possible that these two things kind of just sort of evolved together themselves, and I don't, um, in, rather than sort of being like a linear uh, sort of evolution. And I, I actually kind of wanted to throw it to, to Patrick because you're within the sort of space of, of, of industry to sort of hear what, um, you, know, uh, you, you know, so your, your perspective on 
are these things really just sort of a linear evolution of from military down to uh, you know down to civilian use, or are they actually two different things that have sort of grown up differently? Uh, I, I think they're two different things, and I would say that uh, really that's uh, hyperbole uh, and braggadocio about this being strictly military technology. I'm going to say that most of this technology came out of the um, RC hobby flying world. Um, that's where it really came from. I mean, we look at some of these systems and people are, oh, we're beating the swords into plowshares, but, uh, you know, the Scan Eagle. Scan Eagle was developed by a guy named Tad McGear. I use this as an example all the time. That system was uh, developed to find tuna fish, launch off of a ship, uh, and land on a ship. That's what that was designed for, and it basically came out of the hobby world. Uh, you know, Boeing decided that they liked it, and they got involved in it, but also, um, you know, another company like uh, Aero, Envi Aero Environment uh, got their start. Uh, Dr. McCready uh, did other, uh, he, he was a, a modeler, an aviation guy. He actually did a um, human-powered aircraft uh, that's in the Smithsonian and things like that. And so a lot of these technologies came out of that. And, you know, I think Bo hit, was it Bo that asked the question out of the audience here? You know, the broad brush that drones get hit with, I call it droneism. And it's like any other ism, where people aren't really aware of the history, of the, uh, the, the culture of a technology, and they start hitting it with these things. I mean, the last panel I do think uh, you kind of alluded to was a little bit hostile. Um, I don't really have, as a, a member of the drone community, which I started this in a, in a, on the commercial side, I have no sway over the current presidential administration's policy. If I, I voted for the other guy. This stuff was going on. We knew it was happening. Kill chain goes all the way back to Mr. Obama's desk. And if you don't like it, this is still a democracy and you vote these people out. I, I don't really like getting caught in that conversation because I have no sway over that. I do uh, some stuff with the military, mainly the stuff that I've done as lately is uh, communications and networks. Uh, I have worked on projects where uh, this technology was used for um, ISR, they call it, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance. And it's, it, it, is, it was used to, you know, uh, force protection for guys that are on the ground there, and it's also used for drug interdiction and gun interdiction and security for villages. Um, and, there, and there have been humanitarian uses for it. And so I think when we paint it with this broad brush that all drones are bad, and it's up to the community to you know, be the savior, that's, I don't really think that's up to the community. I mean, I want to take pictures and I want to make money with it. I want to help feed a hungry world. I want to um, you know, do art. I want to do uh, pipeline surveys, whatever I want to do with it. I don't really want to <clears throat> go other places and kill people. I'm just asking for legal income streams. And I, and, I, and I think that people need to kind of put their feet back on the ground when they hear that this is military technology. I definitely think it's more RC technology, even seeing that, uh, what Raphael did with off-the-shelf RC technology that you can buy. Anybody in this room, anybody, I would say, with a sixth grade education can cobble this stuff together and fly it around. Are they wrong because they're not protesting that we shouldn't be using them for military uses? Yeah, and I was actually going to say, Frank, I think that leads into the uh, <laughs> Yeah, I think that leads a, a lot into some of the stuff that Frank has, has spoken about in, um, yeah, sure. uh, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I really, I, I find myself, um, you know, in the middle of the two speakers in, in many ways. And, <laughs> and I think that the one thing that I would start with is to say that I think that we could very easily get bogged down in what uh, James Boyle calls mutually annihilating narratives. So, you know, so for example, we could say the drones could save the Occupy protesters by essentially, you know, they, or at least if not save them, report on, say, police brutality or other really troubling actions by, say, the authorities. And then you've got the other side saying, well, you know, it's relatively easy to retrofit them as long range acoustical devices. I don't know if anyone's heard of an LRAD, but that's the newest, uh, or new technology of crowd control where you can sort of blast people with sound just up to the point of causing pain or deafness. Um, and sort of control uh, crowds in that way. And so I think you could tell, you can spin these narratives um, uh, in either direction. And I fear that a lot of times that because these mutually annihilating narratives are available, they lead to uh, complacent continuumism. A, a, a thought that essentially, the drone is just like putting a camera on a model plane or something. And, and this is, comes up in law a lot, where people resist the idea that there needs to be new law of technology because they feel that the old laws can simply be applied to the new scenarios. 
I resist the complacent continuumism because I do think we are seeing a difference of quality uh, and not just of degree with the drones. And I think that there are two major sources of rights in the US Constitution that are really going to collide very soon. And one, I believe, is privacy rights, uh, which although not very aggressively vindicated in constitutional forums by the Supreme Court, are vindicated in various statutes. And you're going to see statutes, I think, against, say, the creepy ex or creepy neighbor flying a little drone to watch on you know, people or whatever that may be. Very hard to legislate, but I do predict that that sort of thing's going to happen. On the other hand, you have First Amendment law, and you have a Supreme Court that has been very aggressive about characterizing forms of data collection as First Amendment protected, particularly seen in the Sorrell versus IMS health case of a few years ago, uh, where they protected a rather a Byzantine system of transfers of pharmaceutical information. And so I think that as these two things collide, what I hope we can preserve, and what was not preserved in Sorrell, but what I hope we can preserve is a thought that we do not simply have rights colliding, but that we have a system of regulating the distribution of knowledge. And, part, and I would recommend two things for that system, one being um, a license plate for drones. I think there was an article by Joseph Hall, is that right? Yeah, he's might? also leading a session tomorrow. Honestly. Yeah, so that's a great article, a terrific idea, because it essentially you know, helps us build knowledge about the system of developing knowledge within the sort of hobbyist uh, private uh, drone community. Another would be that I really hope we see maybe limits on the numbers of drones. You know, I don't want to see private actors getting you know, 10,000 micro drones together or something. I think we do have to worry about the potential threat to the uh, state's monopoly on legitimate use of violence in those situations. So I think that with some sort of sensible regulations, I don't want to sound like too much of a meliorist here, but I think with some sensible regulations, we can try to get at some of the worst aspects of the technology while still recognizing the incredible upside. And the last point I guess I would make in terms of the military, the, the provenance of the technology would be, um, I don't discredit anything just because it comes out of military uh, funding. Um, I think if you look at Mariana Matsukato's uh, brilliant new book, The Entrepreneurial State, she ties virtually everything that's in an iPhone or iPad to sort of ARPA, defense, uh, other forms of government funding. And I think that you know, we have to recognize that, especially in an era where all other aspects of state power are being defunded, as you know, Bernard Harcourt has described in his, uh, in his work, um, maybe the only thing left in terms of a lot of innovative funding in many areas. So that would just be one last point I'd make. Yeah, and I think that that's actually a pretty decent segue into, into what John uh, is saying. So in, in, in U.S. v. Jones, you know, we had Justice Alito uh, with the quote, you know, in the pre-computer age, the greatest protections of privacy uh, were neither constitutional nor statutory, but, but practical. Um, and I think that that, you know, obviously U.S. v. Jones was not about uh, drones, but I think it's obviously very applicable here. Um, and I think it touches a lot on the sort of point that you were trying to make about, about the surveillance and, and this sort of complacency of, you know, you know, this, this system is, of laws has lasted for a very long time, um, but now all of a sudden the game is changing, right? The practicality, it's, it's, it's much harder to get out of like the line of sight of a drone than it is, to, you know, you can't just walk away, right? Because these things can move, they can follow you. So I'd actually like to hear what, you know, John, so John, your sort of take on, on that as a, uh, yeah. Um, okay, a couple of things if I can. So first of all, just USV Jones, as, as most people in the room probably know, was a case which had to do with um, the constitutionality of installing a GPS tracker uh, uh, in a suspect in a drug case. And actually, the majority ruling was narrowly based on the physical act of trespass involved in attaching the tracker and, and didn't actually focus on the tracking itself. So USV Jones is actually most interesting with respect to the, currents, the concurrences are written separately, one by uh, Justice Alito and another by Justice Sotomayor, which raised sort of these broader questions of what the Fourth Amendment um, prescription or pr prohibitions may or may not be with respect to what uh, government can do. But um, I'd like to sort of respond at least to some of the things I've heard more generally. Um, one is I, I think uh, there's a mistake that's often made in these discussions to conflate military drones or unmanned aircraft with drone strikes as the only appli implied application and without in any way downplaying the very significant questions that arise with respect to drone strikes, I think it's also important to recognize that there are most military uses are not actually drone strikes. So if I'm, if I'm a, on patrol, a, a US soldier on patrol in Afghanistan, and I can use an unmanned aircraft to see around the bend or over the hill in front of me, um, I'd have a hard time if someone told me not to do that because that was somehow a morally compromised act. Uh, and therefore, I should suffer an increased risk of, of getting attacked. 
Uh, secondly, unfortunately, I think the dialogue in this space often seems to be influenced, and we've seen it here, by this assumption that any technology that the US government or the DOD develops is somehow inherently bad. Uh, and I think that's problematic. I think uh, uh, all of us in this room probably found out about and registered for and got here thanks to the internet. And of course, as we all know, the internet uh, is uh, a DARPA-funded technology which has uh, benefited you know, almost really everybody in the world. Third, I think we do need to somehow um, not run too far away from the premise that how a technology is used is just as important as the technology itself. Case in point, uh, air, manned aircraft, aircraft with human, human beings in the cockpit, have of course been used to inflict really unimaginable suffering over the last, call it 70 or 80 years. You, you can't even imagine, none of us can imagine the, the suffering that has occurred. Yet, most, many of us, and me among them, among them, uh, we arrived here uh, by taking an airplane. Uh, and I didn't think when I got on an airplane yesterday from California that I was somehow morally compromised or complicit in any negative things that have happened from airplanes just because I got on one. And I don't think any of you would either if you go on vacation to Hawaii. That's not an act of, of a morally questionable act just because airplanes have been used to inflict violence. And I, and I do think, I do think uh, that matters. Uh, with respect to um, domestic use, this panel is the right to drones. So I wanted to at least uh, briefly uh, talk about what that, what that might be. Um, with the right to drones, we're really not talking about government users, which is really what the Fourth Amendment uh, uh, is related to, but we're talking about non-government users, private parties. And uh, as uh, our panelists from the University of Maryland alluded to, um, there's a tension. Uh, on the one hand, all of us uh, as private individuals have an affirmative First Amendment right to gather information. And then the question, so that's, and the question is, where does that collide or impinge on uh, protections against privacy? And I'll mention two or three protection, privacy protections that matter. One is trespassing. There's a really interesting and, as far as I'm aware, not completely settled question of who controls the lowest reaches of the airspace. In other words, uh, it would stand to reason that if somebody wants to fly a drone at five, five feet above the ground around my backyard, that that is something I ha would have the power to stop, right? That, that, that my control over my backyard uh, uh, would ex include being able to prohibit somebody from flying around at you know, chest or, or head level there. Does it preclude them from being able to fly overhead at 500 feet? Well, probably not. 40 feet? you can have interesting discussions about whether and where there's, there's some sort of cutoff. So trespassing is an, and control of lower airspace is an area which is going to become extremely important in the, in the coming years. Secondly, there's invasion of privacy. There's uh, four, basically, uh, forms of common law invasion, invasion of privacy. And in some cases, in some states, there's also statutory protections as well. But the two, the two common law invasion of privacy torts that are most applicable to drones are intrusion upon seclusion and publication of private facts. I'll give an example uh, where intrusion upon seclusion came into play in a way that, that illustrates uh, what ha might happen with drones. This didn't involve drones, but a, a number, back late 90s, I believe, there was a TV uh, emergency, one of these emergency programs, like 911 type things, and they went and filmed a car accident, the victims of a car accident, and the car had gone some distance off the road, and they filmed the, the people as they were being you know, put t taken into a rescue helicopter filmed their conversations without, of course, their consent because they were injured in the car accident. And, and, and the people uh, brought suit. Uh, and while um, there wasn't actually a final disposition in the court because it got settled, the California Supreme Court, in basically affirming uh, having something having to do with a summary judgment motion, said that the plaintiffs did have a reasonable expectation of privacy. And just the mere fact that they were not, just the mere fact that they were in public didn't mean they had no residual uh, expectation of privacy. And the distinction they drew was that, uh, that their conversations would normally not have been audible to somebody who was just on the road. You had to go actually out of the way to capture their conversations. So I think that's very instructive to the extent that if people use drones to fill in the gaps, to capture information about private conversations, even potentially in a public space, that wouldn't have otherwise been accessible without that technology, um, there is at least a reasonable case that might be made that that's an invasion uh, of privacy. Two closing things I'll mention. Um, one is uh, stalking statutes are also potentially relevant. Um, I mean, you can, uh, if there was a survey that uh, some government agency, I can't remember which did, about the various uh, stalking problems that, that occur, and, and it's, it's sobering reading to read the, all the various nefarious ways that stalkers use technological methods to 
to, uh, to harass and stalk people. And so uh, we'd have to be very naive to expect that nobody uh, will ever misuse uh, a drone uh, for that purpose. And then finally, I'll mention business privacy as a really interesting area and one I don't see discussed, um, discussed uh, as much as I think it should be. Uh, one specific example, a few years ago, uh, a man in Texas flew an unmanned aircraft over a slaughterhouse and took pictures and was able with those pictures to determine, to identify what he thought to be violations uh, and then he reported the slaughterhouse and uh, I think it was a Coast Guard or some government agency came in and did an investigation and did in fact find some problems. In that case, of course, very few of us would run to the defense of a slaughterhouse uh, accused of environmental violations, but it raises broader questions about, um, about the right of, of w how far private citizens can go. I'll give you a counter example. Some, peop some people might know the Kylo Supreme Court ruling. Uh, Kylo basically held that the police use of a thermal imager in a car, nothing to do with drones, a thermal imager in a car to see that the walls of a house were abnormally warm and therefore to infer that somebody was growing marijuana inside in, in the Supreme Court in Kylo, they, they ruled that that was a Fourth Amendment search. In other words, that was unconstitutional. So the question I would pose is if uh, a private citizen were to use a drone and, and make the same sort of observations and then sort of turn someone into the police, um, what would protect against that? And so there's, there's, there's all sorts of, because of course the private citizen is not constrained by the Fourth Amendment in the way that the government is. So these are some of the many issues that I think are gonna come to play uh, as we talk about domestic uh, unmanned aircraft. Uh, Patrick, I saw you yeah, nodding your head a little bit. Uh, well, he actually covered a lot of uh, real estate in, in that, but uh, I think, you know, even, um, did, you know, do we have the, that right? I mean, I don't see why people shouldn't be able to do this themselves. I do think that there are concerns uh, with privacy, but I mean, I have a statistic just on the, on the government side of this. South of Canal Street, it's purported that there are 4,000 plus cameras and plate readers in Lower Manhattan. And I mean, is, to, to, to me it sounds like, hmm, you know, I mean, you're under constant surveillance. When I hear the privacy thing with the drones, another, I'm gonna refer back to Raphael's video, and, and when you saw the video from him flying around, there were, I think, in the Millennium Wheel there, you could see there was a family in there and a mother picking up a child, but what exactly, what from that sensor could you see? I mean, I couldn't make out any fe uh, features in her face, or if it was a girl or a boy, or, or whatever else. Um, I think that's another thing with the sensors. I mean, people say, well, sensor technology is getting better and cheaper and all the rest of that, but uh, most of the stuff that is in the price range that we could afford as, as hobbyists or small business users or whatever, um, there's a certain standoff distance on there. And I don't know, I, I'm sure there's gonna be people that are gonna use it to do creepy things like people have done with cell phones. I mean, I'm sure everybody's seen that, but I think for the most part, people want to use it for business, want to go out there, uh, are, are in the uh, mode that they want to make some money with it and don't want to create any problems for themselves or anyone else. Frank, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I do think though that uh, we, we should hedge that optimism um, with the sense that you know, people have a right to understand the nature of these surveillance systems. So it is true, you could impute to Americans and to New Yorkers a certain implied consent, perhaps, to, you know, mass surveillance, given how little the issue sometimes seems to register within political debates proper. Um, and maybe that's changing. On the other hand, um, there's huge outrage when we don't know the nature of the surveillance system. Um, and I think that that does make a lot of sense. So, and I think that there are some, and the technology, the amazing thing always about technology here is that, you know, it's often said, oh, regulation is going to stifle the technology. Um, I like a, a talk I once heard by Paul Ohm, a former uh, technologist at the FTC was, you know, the internet recognizes a lot of blockages, damage, and routes around it. Perhaps it can recognize, uh, technology in general can recognize some forms of regulation, and if not, route around them, accommodate them. So for the examples, with these drone examples, you know, um, Ed Felton once mentioned um, that cameras would uh, have a red light on when they're on you, you know. And I tend to think that's something that, you know, even with ranges from Google Glass to drones, a way of notifying people that they're being watched I think is pretty important in thinking about that technology um, in order to preserve some sphere of you know, what, what Goffman calls off-stage life. Because we just don't want to live in that society. The other thing too is that, you know, think about like on a, a Snapchat, the chat, uh, it, you are notified if you send the Snapchat and then the person like uses a screenshot to take something that should have only existed for 15 seconds, I believe people are notified back 
that the person they sent it to, whom they had trusted to merely take on this ephemeral image, actually was trying to make it permanent. And I think that you know, that recognition, that essentially that you know, evening the playing field in those sort of small ways, I think is a clue to a larger um, uh, project of making sure that the systems of knowledge that are generated by this technology are open to people. You know, and, the, and the last example I would give would just be the Glick decision out of the First Circuit, giving people a right to record the police. You know, and I think that uh, as there's more private law enforcement, entities that are essentially taking on private juridical power, or public juridical power as private entities, the right to know what they're doing and how they're watching is very important and should be uh, the prerogative of citizens. Yeah, uh, Christina, you kind of looked like you had a response to that. Um, I don't know where in the dialogue, <laughs> the swirling dialogue, I wanted to jump in. but. Uh, a couple of things that I wanted to point out that I think are, you know, symptomatic perhaps of some of the differences in opinion, but I want to kind of come back to them. Um, a couple of the people up here have said, you know, and so what if it was a technology developed with military funding or something, and that, you know, people often raise the internet as a prime example that, you know, it was developed with DARPA funding, but then it's been reclaimed by civilian society. Uh, and certainly during wartime, you know, for a very long time, but certainly, you know, with World War I and radio, telegraphy, telephony technology, World War II, further miniaturization, of course, many of our consumer electronics come out of the military urge to miniaturize and you know, build solid state things to make communication in the field better and then after war uh, is over, we're back to civilian applications. Of course that's true, um, but you know, the way in which the internet was in the 80s decoupled from, or what, what is now the internet, was decoupled from ARPANET is kind of a historical accident in certain ways. Um, NSFNet, and, and you know, it could have gone a couple different ways. More and more people were kind of being asked by the scientists and engineers and techie community using the internet at that time to sort of hop on. It, uh, and it could have gone as easily like kick everybody else off as a security <laughs> measure instead of we'll make this network, we'll peel it off and make it a more civilian uh, choice. And so that you could argue, again, is a historical accident, but you could also argue came from a certain drive amongst people using technology to say this has a civilian use and we want to protect and enshrine that, right? So it's, it's more complicated. I don't think, I don't want to speak for anyone else. I'm not up here just saying uh, technologies that have origins in military R&D are bad. Also, I mean, the line between what's military, what's industry, and what's university hasn't been a bright one since at least World War II, and I work in a university, so I'm aware of that. Um, but again, we want to be mindful, right? That's, that's my point. It's not just, you know, thumbs down. It's mindfulness. Uh, the other thing, though, that makes me actually rather sad, and I think Frank said this as a note of realism, which I really appreciate, but also want to kind of speak to, is if we know that state funding is evaporating in all these other places. Uh, you know, NSF is being attacked daily and the government's shut down and whatever. You know, is it merely pragmatic to say we'll seek military funding and not worry about that being, um, you know, a source for funding innovation that might not have military application? Uh, I mean, that's one way to look at it, but I think that some of what's going on, again, with hobbyists, this is related to a whole lot of discourse around kind of entrepreneurship and neoliberalism and, and bootstrapping that really has to do with the fact that a whole bunch of our civic spaces are being decimated, right? And, you know, again, we maybe want to acknowledge some of that reality and work within it, but also I really feel strongly about articulating and pointing out that that's happening, and maybe that's not the society that we want to live in, and it has much wider implications than, you know, what our sort of small technical options or range of innovation or innovation paths might be. I think it is a much wider set of, of values, and it's not only about, you know, whether we're living in a militarized society per se, but it's do we want libraries, do we want schools, do we want, 
you know, all these things that give opportunity for lots of different kinds of actors, including businesses, uh, or do we want to kind of seed the ground there to industry and, and military funding? So that's a question I have. Yeah. Well, I would love to throw that at you guys. I mean, do any of you guys want to respond to that? No, I'm, I, <laughs> I definitely do get that concern, and I think that that is a real, and I think that one of the missed opportunities, I think, in privacy debates recently has been not just sort of um, what, what, what sometimes becomes a bit of a, of, a, uh, of a black hole of sort of just pushing back and saying we don't want to be watched, and I think there might be a more productive way for privacy advocates to say, well, here's what we want to watch. You know, like stop watching all of us, you know, and sort of these, these like more private settings as personal individuals, maybe start more business surveillance or start more surveillance that seems more productive for the economy as a whole. Sure. Uh, John, I kind of feel like it, uh, within the sort of, uh, you're also in the university space uh, within like the more sort of technical electrical engineering side. I mean, are you, do you get the same, sort of sense from uh, the kind of stuff that you guys are doing you know, that is happening in research-wise within like the engineering community? Well, I, I think, I mean, I don't want to steer too far away from the panel. I mean, it's, yeah. it's well known that uh, research funding for universities has been just very, very difficult uh, across the board. Government funding, private funding, um, and that's, that's, an, that's a very unfortunate fact, um, but I don't know that that's directly uh, something that we'd correlate. I think drones are kind of a largely separate issue. I don't think I would uh, really say that those are too closely intertwined. I think we'd still, even if research funding was robust, I think this, this conference could still have taken place and many of the same issues would still have been raised. Mm -hmm. uh, Patrick, yeah. And let me, actually, let me just also say that, I, I, again, I respectfully will, will push back on someone who then suggests that there's something wrong with accepting funding. Uh, and I guess I'll raise my hand. I have accepted government funding for my work and I don't think I'm not at all ashamed of having done so. Um, uh, for example, if the government funds somebody to figure out good ways to defend against cyber attacks, is that, is that somehow morally compromised? I certainly, I certainly don't think so. So I think, um, again, there's th this assumption that government equals bad that I, I think is, is it, frankly, uh, incorrect. Pretty sure I didn't say that. I've also accepted government funding for my research. It's on my website, so, yeah, yeah. Patrick, yeah. <coughs> yeah I don't I don't think that government funding is bad, but um, even again, uh, the, the notion that like all the people that are doing the drone thing are, are have a military bent, or a lot of them are engineers at military companies. I, I'm, I talk to people all around the world uh, every day. I mean, I do the uh, SUS News website, and I talk to a lot of people that are <clears throat> they're not military. The, most of them are, are engineers. They're they're kids, you know, that are going to UC Berkeley. And uh, you know they're like, oh, I've, I'm, I'm developing this, and it can do this, and I'm doing this, and they're pushing the boundaries. And I think that you know one of the technologies that we talked about is the the internet has allowed, um, let's say, broader exposure to different technologies. And most of the stuff that's uh, in drones and even the surveillance part of that is consumer-based goods. You know, Sony 3 CCD cameras, you know, that you can buy and you solder and then there's some guy and he's writing code or, you know, it's some guy just with a radio or... Uh, I, I think that there's a lot of um, uh, opportunities for people who may not have had the opportunity geographically where they live, let's say the, um, the people in that community to know about technologies like this or code like that or where to buy these parts and pieces to put it together and I and and that's available to everyone anywhere now so anybody could be the the like that goes right back to this sixth grader making so I mean is that is that sort of akin there like to like uh, like a right to just sort of be on like an equal playing field right so if you have like a democratization of, of technology like I mean, is that the kind of right that you're talking about? I think, well, you know, I'll even point to the space grant. When I was in high school, I thought it was cool. They just ended, uh, they had a thing where you could learn how to fly a plane. That budget cut came in when I got there. But now they have the space grant, and kids can actually launch uh, experiments into space due to the space grant. And I'm like, man, that is really cool. So what, you know, what has allowed that? The, the miniaturization, the advancements in technology, um, you know, privatization of these technologies. The same with, uh, I think, that uh, commercial space flight is a huge um, untapped, let's say, uh, community and source of, of funding uh, for technologies that people that are horsing around with drones now may actually move into that. So 
I think all technology is good. All technology can be abused, and we've seen that. And, um, but I don't, I'm not really afraid of, of the guys out there that are tinkering and making, even the hacker fest people, you think it, the hacker thing, even themselves, I think that has negative connotations, you know, and you're, the, the guy from hacker fest, hey, can I borrow your thumb drive? You're like, eh, <laughs> nah, it's okay, but, you know, they were like, we're going to have a drone hackathon. Well, you know, what does that mean? They're going to actually sit down and, and actually come up with a business plan um, for a drone. I mean, even, you know, Chris isn't here, but, you know, I was over at their, their shop the other day, and it's like, you know, they have something that they've kind of put together and some people on the internet have written code for and some other guys have designed some parts for it. So it's like this huge community effort uh, that has developed into a product. And, and those guys, most of them, I would say in, in that community and where I'm from, are, are, are pretty liberal and anti-military type people. And he's doing all he can to, to find out what he can do with that. Yeah. Great. So I, I think I would just comment that by saying, I mean, I, I recently wrote a review of um, Gabrielle Coleman's book, um, and, and, and she speaks a lot about hackers, and she has a very good sense of the emancipatory potential of hacking and, the, and how much the folks involved are into freedom. And I totally get that. Um, and I, I think that, you know, when, but when you mentioned the, the nature of the development of the technology, the thought I had about it was, you know, I think that it can be regulated in good ways, and I'll admit it can be regulated in bad ways. So I mentioned some good potential regulations, like with the license plate and perhaps the, you know, keeping tabs on the numbers of, say, particular uh, entities having them. Um, we also have seen in copyright, you know, some rather clumsy efforts to regulate technology, um, both in the U.S. and around the world. I don't know if anyone remembers in the 90s, like, digital audio tape uh, sort of counters that would try to keep track of how many copies something was making, or other efforts uh, with, the, with uh, the anti-circumvention technology that is protected under the DMCA. And so what I want to ask, I guess the way I would pose this question is, you know, we can't just accept, the, to accept an idea that technology just develops on its own. We know that it's regulated. We know that law plays a role in that. And can we envision a world where privacy or some sorts of social values like privacy can be designed into technology the same way in which our copyright legislation has tried to des uh, de design into certain forms of technology ways of protecting artist rights or corporate prerogative, however you want to frame it. And I think that the copyright example is a warning. It's a warning you know, not to have the government try to work too hard to shape the future direction of, say, this technology or others. But the question is, you know, and this gets, I think, to what Christina's, I think what is Christina's core point, or one of her core points is that, you know, government can shape the development of technology in very positive ways, and that trying to sort of work towards what Helen Nissenbaum here calls privacy by design, other things, you know, that I would like to see the, communi the, the community of people working with drones be open to that, dialogue about that, uh, you know, at this conference and other stations. I've seen that in other places, and I think that the more openness there is to that type of, uh, those type of opportunities, the better. Yeah, I mean, so is, uh, I, I guess, are we saying, though, that there is, um, that the sort of having a right to drone is sort of, uh, you know, it changes, it's going to continue to change as, like, the technology evolves, so maybe what we have as a justification today, you know, isn't necessarily going to be the same kind of thing that... Oh, we, sure, sure, and I mean, Ed, the, the core idea here, I think, is Ed Felton's idea of freedom to tinker. You know, that was his big problem with a lot of the regulation of copying was that he couldn't tinker with the technology he was using and really play around with it, and especially for lawful personal use, you know. And I think that is a core concept we have to respect. But we also have to be very flexible to realize, well, at some point, you know, Francis Fukuyama brought up in one of his uh, drone editorials about the possibility of a drone the size of a mosquito that can inject a deadly bite or something, you know. And I know that's science fiction. I know a lot of people don't want to be worried about that right now. But I want to have regulators that are at least thinking about that type of possibility in the future and able to move rather quickly on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you kind of look like you're. Well, I mean, talk about regulation, but I'm going mean, to go right back to uh, NSA, you know, uh -huh. and the data collection, and then even the cameras down here. I mean, who's watching the regulators? Where is the outcry of that? I mean, we talk about privacy, but I, I did during the ABA uh, conference, you know, I mean, I'll just ask this question. Are you on your cell phone and your computer more, or are you in the backyard sunbathing naked? Uh, I mean, I don't even go out in the backyard. I'm on the computer and I'm on the phone. If you have either one of those, you know, you are yeah, being but, monitored. 
I would say, though, in response, though, I mean, there is stuff from Glenn Greenwald and Laura Plotris and the others who sort of put out uh, best practices for journalists, or Chris Segoyan has these best practices for journalists to try to avoid having their sources compromised. And I think we have to be very realistic and say, wow, well, if we have a world where real space is entirely surveilled, um, then their methods are, are circumvented too. Uh, so I think it's, it's not just a matter of saying, well, there's this world where we know we're totally surveilled and then there's this other world where, you know, who cares if people are looking at it episodically. I think that these things do integrate and they form, you know, a, a, they could form a very scary picture in the future if they come together. That's true. I do agree with the open dialogue, and even here, and the protesters that were out there. I mean, I went out there and talked to those people, and every opportunity that I get, I, I do. Uh, I did UC Berkeley Law, I did uh, UC Berkeley, or I'm sorry, the Berkeley Drone Town Hall meeting, and I think it is very important for people in this community to, to talk to these people and listen to them, and listen to, you know, we had a great discussion out there in a the discourse, and I think it's important. Uh, it goes back to educating people about what we are about and what we are going to do, and uh, dispelling some of the fears, you know? And, and I think that's a very important point that you made. Um, so I actually want to try to take maybe like one or two questions from the audience as well. Dean, can you grab the microphone? Yeah. Can we get house lights just a little bit? What's that? Yeah, but I, I can't really see from <laughs> here. Uh, questions? Okay. One over here, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't have to introduce myself, I did already. Um, at the last panel, it was sort of the possibility of uh, treaties being used by, uh, with nation states to uh, restrict the military use of drones was kind of floated a little bit. But we're coming to a point where non-state actors using off-the-shelf components, like terrorist criminals or what have you, will be able to do bad things. And so the question is, is there a, uh, a way to uh, you know, preserve the right to tinker and to do useful creative things and at the same time restrict the bad actors who don't play by the rules and will not, you know, not follow them. That is where I hope the license plate idea would play an important role. You know, the idea that each one needs to be registered in some ways. But I, but I also, I totally acknowledge the, the pushback there too. You know, if you want to I, I think it's beyond the license plate thing. I mean, it, it's like anything else. I mean, if you're going to abide by the law, you're going to, I mean, laws are made for people that are going to abide by them. People that break the law are going to do their own thing. I mean, this technology is already in use by like Hezbollah and, uh, you know, we talked about a treaty and I would say that soon as the Chinese or the Iranians, uh, let's say, hit a technological level where they can whack people in other countries, I think we'll see some treaties <laughs> internationally. We're like, eh, maybe you were right, and we shouldn't do this. That's my prediction. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. People who don't play by the rules. I don't think there's any way to keep them out. It's too, it, the technology is too far advanced, and you can buy it. A lot of it's made in China. Uh, do we have another one? Up there. Yeah, there. Yeah. Hi, my name is Paul Voss. I'm from uh, Smith College uh, Engineering Program, and uh, see a lot of value of this te uh, technology for STEM education. I think it's tremendously motivating and important. Um, and I want to ask a question about um, where the technology is appropriate in terms of the right to drone. In other words, uh, in your living room, in your basement, maybe it's okay, in your backyard, over your patio, uh, near the Statue of Liberty, these are very different environments. And I just kind of wanted to hear uh, in terms of your perspectives of where it might be okay to work with this technology. Thank you. I mean, I, I really was upset to hear about like ad gag laws trying to keep people from using this sort of technology to find out about abuses of animals or other sorts of things. And, and I think that um, uh, I know there's a group that does balloon mapping, I, I think in New York and then elsewhere about trying to find environmental harms. And I think, to me, those sorts of uses are sort of per se valuable. They should just be, and, and I, I would even extend constitutional protection to something like that, because I think those are very important uses of perhaps even people being seen in a private attorney general function. Um, so. Oh, here's someone here. 
Hi, uh, Fred Masson, just a guy. Um, I guess a rogue agent who bought shelves off the part and made my own flame wheel that I can, I guess, do whatever I want if I so choose. Um, I came here expecting more of a conversation about what we can expect in the future. Uh, will I be able to make money in the future? What kind of roads are we going to go down to make sure that people can do this responsibly and for profit? And I'm hearing a lot of uh, military, military, military. Um, I mean, great, it's new. You roll out a new operating system, everyone's afraid of it. Um, but it seems that if we want to demystify or get away from this military thing, then like you said, with the internet, we shouldn't be pointing out where the money came from and how, how it's used for bad things. We should be promoting jumping on top of it, getting everyone involved. And then this drone community will be like the internet, where no one's afraid of it. But to trying to get back on the, on the point for me, these privacy issues that we're all concerned about, are they all moot, or is just we're bringing it up again because it's a new technology? There was a case a few weeks ago about a photographer who used a telephoto lens to take pictures of people in their apartment, and he sold those pictures, and he could keep them. So just because my camera is now on a flame wheel, how does that change the argument? It's a picture of people outside. I, you know, the privacy thing is one issue, but I think we need as a society to look at uh, the privacy issue more holistically and, and some of the examples that I've given. The thing with the drone thing, and, and this is something too, I mean, I've been a proponent for uh, small unmanned aircraft and business use for years. The, the thing that we have to realize, and I think a lot of people lose sight of that, is the airspace or the NAS, the National Airspace System, is something that's already occupied by uh, other users the, the uh, Part 121 or the uh, livery aircraft and also GA and police and all the rest of this thing and we have to be let's say good neighbors moving into that airspace. If you ask people from the manned aviation world they will tell you you know I'm up there betting my life you're flying a toy. So I think that what we really need uh, before this industry is really going to get off the ground no pun intended is common sense regulation. Um, I've been working on that. I think that we need to carve out a space for us to use this technology and use it, um, let's say, safely and respectab respectively. And, uh, you know, be good neighbors in the NAS, even with the privacy thing. I mean, you know, uh, I think most people have kind of a moral compass and you think, well, you know, if I'm looking in this woman's window, that's probably a bad thing. If her husband caught me out here, he'd probably kick my but whatever. But I think we all have a moral compass. But there is also, like I said, we, we have to have some rules of the road. We need that uh, regulation from the FAA, which has been dragging their feet. But I think that's when you'll really see the potential of this explode. And there will be a numbering system like uh, license plates or whatever. You have to have that. And there'll also be some training and whatever else. And I think that privacy will probably be a part of that. And then we can all get to work and make money with this technology. Yeah. Um so I think we actually out, are out of time, but I want to thank my, our, our panelists, and if you guys give them a huge round of applause. Thank you guys for joining us.